Good afternoon and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Dr. Richard Cardwell, former staff geophysicist at Chevron, and I'll be your host today. We also welcome our listening audiences and invite everyone to visit us online at www.commonwealthclub.org. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker. Dr. Maui Barazanji received his bachelor degree from Damascus University in Syria and his master's from the University of Minnesota. He completed his PhD in seismology at Columbia University in 1971. After graduation, he joined the research staff of the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Cornell University. Following that, during the period from November 1978 until June of 1980, he was professor and chairman of the Department of Geophysics at King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. He then returned to Cornell as a senior scientist, and then in 1998, he was appointed a full professor. He also served as associate director of the Institute for the Study of the Continents at Cornell from 1998 through 2010. Dr. Berezanji is a member of the Seismological Society of America, the Geological Society of America, and the American Geophysical Union, which is having its meeting here this week in San Francisco. Dr. Berezanji is one of the world's experts on geology and earthquake hazards of the Middle East. In today's presentation, he will discuss the geologic factors that bring together the occurrence of large reserves of oil, along with the potential for large damage damaging earthquakes in the region. In addition, he will discuss his views on the role of science and technology in the region. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Maui Berzanji. Yeah, good afternoon. And uh, my name is Maui Berzanji. And uh, I thank you, Celia, for making this lecture possible. And I thank my colleague, Dr. Richard Cardwell, for agreeing to be the moderator. This lecture will not be a traditional, typical one. It addresses three subjects and will include scientific information and facts, as well as analysis, interpretation, concerning current and future policies and suggested strategies. You will not find the information that I will present in a single publication. And mo most probably, you will not agree about parts of it. That is OK. I will, see, I will use a limited number of PowerPoint slides. The background information I'm going to provide you came from many, many, many sources. It's too numerous to cite here, but especially concerning the oil issue and the earthquake hazard. But I will just say a few of the references concerning the issue of science in the Arab world. The references include information from the Arab League, educational and cultural and scientific organization, Alexo, the Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, ESCOA, UNESCO science report, they have many science reports, the last one, 2010, UNDP human development reports, and the Arab human development reports, and the Third World Academy of Sciences, and many, many other published papers and references and organization. But as important, my experience for the past 30 years working in the Arab region, all the way from in the west, Morocco, to the east, to Kuwait, from north and Turkey, south to Yemen. I'm extremely familiar with the Arab world. I will discuss three subjects in this lecture. At its face value, it appears as if the three subjects are not related, but I argue that they are indeed related. The oil story is that the main strategic natural resource in the Arab region is oil. It represents the Arab wealth, and the West has a lot of interest in its production, management, and its control. The earthquake story, next to the diminished 
water resources in the Middle East, this is a major natural hazard that will affect human life, infrastructure, and wealth in the future. The last subject, science. Ideally, wealth, the wealth, should be used wisely in human development in order to create a new knowledge and innovation in all spheres of life. And this is where there is a major failure in the Arab world. Let me give you a brief summary. Those of you either decide to take a little nap before lunch or after <laughs> if you have lunch, or you must leave. I'll give you my three major conclusions now. <laughs> First, the Arabian-Persian Gulf region, I will call it the Gulf, because I don't want to go through argument about whether to call it Persian or Arabian Gulf. I'll call it the Gulf. So when I say the word Gulf, I don't mean Gulf of Mexico. It's the site of the largest proven reserve of conventional oil in the world, and will continue to be the case most probably for the rest of this century. There is another Middle East to be discovered in the present Middle East. Second, earthquake hazard along the northwestern boundary of the Arabian plate, that is along the Dead Sea Fault system, from the Gulf of Aqaba in the south to Turkey in the north, is significant. And sooner or later will result in the destruction of some of the nearby mega cities such as Amman, Jerusalem, Beirut, Damascus, and most probably Alexandria in Egypt, and I'll explain why. Third, in spite of the extreme wealth of the Arab countries in the Gulf, and recognizing the many recent scientific initiative during the recent past, they've been going on right now, there is a definite ongoing decline in science in all the Arab countries. And there is a major crisis in the Arab human development. And there is no hope for a remedy in the near future. This is sad. All the recent initiatives are, at best, like candles in a sea of darkness. Let me briefly discuss the three subjects. First, I'll discuss the oil. To better appreciate the oil story in the Gulf, Arabian, Persian Gulf, it is important to first discuss the global picture. And you really should remember some of this factual information. About 35-40% of world energy comes from oil. And about 25-26, the rest from coal and from natural gas equally. And about the rest, about 12%, come from all other sources, solar, nuclear, wind, geothermal, biofuel, etc. However, as you know, oil is unique because it's used in transportation, at least as of today. Recently, you should know how much oil we need globally. The global oil supply average about 90 million barrels per day. That's what we need, about 90 million barrels of oil per day. And the producing country supplying that. In 2015, we need about, the best estimate, 93 million barrels of oil per day. And best estimate, the projection, we need about 110 million barrels of oil per day in 20, uh, 2035. Remember, the world population then is estimated to be somewhere between 8 to 9 billion people. The United States, we need about, about recently, 21 million barrels of oil per day. About 10 of million of it produced within the US, including Alaska and the Gulf of Mexico, and 11 million barrels is imported per day. 
Remember, however, last year there was a dramatic increase in oil production in the United States, about 25% increase, mainly because of uh, what they call shale oil or uh, uh, in, in North Dakota and Williston Basin or in Texas and other regions. And they're producing more than 1 million barrel a day and production increases. I want, I'm mentioning this to emphasize that in the United States, we have only about 5% of population, but we are using about 22, 23% of the world energy, oil. Where on earth the majority of this conventional oil exists? You say, where is it? Well, I should remind you that 80% of the proven recoverable oil of the whole world are in seven countries only, only seven countries. Five of it in the Gulf region, that is Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, and Iraq, and Iran. Four of them are Arab and Muslims, and Iran, of course, Persian, Muslim. And the other two countries are Venezuela and Russia. All the rest of the world, currently, I, to me, I, details. It's not true, of course. You know, Nigeria, Libya, name it. But they are, they're, the, those seven countries are very important for oil production as of today. 60% of world proven reserve the conventional type oil, exists in the Gulf region. Though produce only about 25% of the daily world supply. Saudi Arabia is producing currently about 11 million barrel of oil per day, the largest in the world. Though Aramco, the national oil company of Saudi Arabia, claimed that their current capacity 11.5 million barrel of oil per day. With a target price of $100 per barrel currently, it goes up and down, Saudi yearly income is more than $300 billion. Remember that figure, more than $300 billion per year. Qatar, which is small little place next to Saudi Arabia is their wealth will be this year 190 billion dollars there's only about half 1 million 1 million people in Qatar they're going to have 190 billion dollars mostly from natural gas all the Arab countries have population of about 350 million people in the Arab world currently little more than the United States. They use only 6 million barrel of oil per day. Ridiculous, ridiculously low. This is an indication of the development or the lack of development in the Arab region in general. And 30% of that 6 million barrel used in Saudi Arabia alone, about somewhere between 20, 30 million people. And the funny part also to remember, I should mention, that Egypt with more than 80 million people, they use the same amount of oil that used by the United Arab Emirates alone with only about two, three million people. Why oil in the Gulf? It's really because of exceptional and optimal geologic condition. And I will not discuss why, because then I guarantee you, you will go to sleep. I will not do that. But I, those interested, I'll be glad to stay behind and answer your question, why the oil? As we think we know, but you don't know. Let me show you the first figure. Can you, Rick, put it? Let me some information and understand why the United States may be interested in the region, the Arab region, especially the Gulf, and maybe why we went to Iraq. 
And we have, I should remind you, we have United States massive military presence in the Gulf region. All the countries, of course, in the Gulf region, except Iran. The Gulf region, it doesn't show up here, but the Gulf region here, this is an old slide called Arabian Gulf. If there is any Iranian in the audience, think of it, said Persian Gulf. And the, now, there are 30, 30 super giant oil field in the region. And we define super giant oil field more than 5 billion of recoverable oil uh, uh, proven reserve. And has about 80 giant oil field, which defined have at least half billion to 5 billion barrels of oil, recoverable proven reserve. Total oil field in the whole Gulf region, about 600. And to make you understand the contrast, in the United States, we have easily more than 30,000 oil field. Romela oil field, this little field here, one of the super giant, mostly in Iraq, southern Iraq, little part of it here in northern Kuwait, is Romela oil field, discovered in 1953. This is, by the way, one of the reasons Saddam Hussein was very unhappy with Kuwait, because they used to drill here and go horizontally and tap it. A super giant oil field has more proven reserve of conventional oil more than the whole United States, including Alaska and the Gulf of Mexico. One super giant oil field. This one here is more. This huge oil field, Ghawar oil field in Saudi Arabia, about 200 plus kilometer in length, 20 kilometer in width, discovered in 1948, produces by itself alone, five million barrel of oil per day. It is considerably much cheaper to drill and produce oil in the Gulf region. It costs only about five million dollars to drill a well in the region, not offshore, but on land. And <clears throat> while some of the deep oil, oil well, could be as much as one billion dollars. It's a huge difference. It's really easy to access. So the end result, it costs only about five dollars per barrel to produce in the Gulf region. And remember, some of the difficult oil in the United States could cost as much as 30 dollars per barrel. The question for us, is the oil production will soon decline in the Gulf region. Is the concept of peak oil will mean the end of oil as proposed and suggested by some recently published books, including currently yesterday I heard some speaker at the American Geophysical Union here in San Francisco, they saying that. The simple answer is no. The proven recoverable, recoverable reserves in the Gulf region is huge and reasonably well documented, though they try to cast shadows on its magnitude. In fact, there is a need for a considerable more exploration drilling, especially in Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Iran. The, remember, Saudi Arabia made a major discovery about 20 years ago in the Paleozoic strata, with the deeper strata, deeper rocks beneath, uh, on the rim of the empty quarter, Rub al Khali, the empty quarter there. And they are producing some, but logistically is difficult. Iraq and Iran, for obvious reason, they have very little exploration for the past 30 years, and they are, were banned from using. Uh, technology the way we understand it. There is every reason to think the whole Mesopotamian trough could be underlain by oil, including Baghdad itself. There will be a lot of oil. In fact, 
the Iraqis, unfortunately, now producing about little over 3 million barrels of oil per day. They want to go to 9 million barrels, they, they said, in 10 years or so. That would be tragedy. I'll explain later if we, if we have time. OPEC recently estimated at least 200 billion barrels of oil to be discovered yet in the Middle East. So the story is not finished, really. The concept of peak oil, as proposed by King Hubbard in 1956, to predict oil production in the lower 48 state is really not valid anymore. First, it will be a plateau type. It will not be a peak type. And second, and more important, the concept assumes that we really know what is available underground, and we don't. Though it is OK for the United States with thousands and thousands of wells being drilled, this is not the case in the Middle East. In one year, the United States drilled about close to 10,000 wells per year, about, while in the whole Middle East, they have only a few hundreds. And that, the concept peak oil assumed that the technology is static, and this is not true. As you know, we are in the middle of a major revolution of shale gas, uh, a different location in the United States, and, this, uh, and fracking, so-called fracking, and more uh, bonanza, really, a natural gas. Though people argue about the magnitude and the, how many years. The question, is it wise for the Arab, especially Saudi Arabia, to maintain and plan to increase current production of oil? All Arab governments say yes. I argue that the answer could be no. Geologically, may not be good to accelerate production. Economically, no need for extra money. Now, considering their development plan, and socially, politically, and future generation, really, the need for future generation maybe is not good. And it's not good for us. They're helping us keep, maintain our addiction to oil. I should mention here, considerable sum of petrodollars. You say, OK, they need the money. Well, billions of dollars are wasteful, wasted, and being wasted on what I call silly projects. United Arab Emirates built the highest building on Earth. I don't know why they need not to use the, the desert around them. They built the highest building, billions of dollars. They have destroyed part of the ecosystem of the Gulf by building islands so that every Bedouin can open his door and find water in front. And that was really, really, uh, very bad judgment to do that, but they did it. And not to mention, like country like Saudi Arabia buying billions of dollars on weapons. Last year, Saudi Arabia have purchased about sixty billion dollars of fighter jets from the United States. Two or three years before that, they purchased twenty billion dollars from United Kingdom, and so on. Many other countries. And not to mention, of course, billions of dollars of Saudi Arabia is being used to purchase American bonds. They are not using it. All those rich Arab countries in a major development of the Arab region. They're using a very trivial amount of money, millions of dollars here and there. But we lack in the Arab region the Bill Gates. We don't have Bill Gates in the Arab land which is sad, we, they, though we have more billionaires than the United States of America, we, they do not uh, put their wealth to the service of human development. To further understand what I'm talking about, the interests of the West, when I say the West, I include Europe and the United States and Canada and so on. In the region, recently, uh, 
a late professor Chapman at Cornell University estimated the total value of known proven reserve in the Gulf region. He made some arithmetic and discussed a lot with geologists and petroleum geologists. It is about $150 trillion, with the letter T, like Tom, $150 trillion worth of wealth, assuming the price of oil will be around $100 per barrel in the region. The question is, who will control this wealth in the future? The USA is in full harmony with all the Arab countries in the Gulf region. The only country, and I should remind you, and democratic countries of the Gulf region, they are in harmony with them. The only country not behaving is Iran, and, uh, for many reasons. Let me stop the issue of oil, and let me discuss a little bit about the earthquakes. Probably more interesting. Arabia, I'm going to go down. Arabian plate is indeed a very beautiful plate. This is the plate on the surface of the earth. It has well-defined boundaries of different kind and have earthquakes along its boundary in the Red Sea here, Gulf of Aden here, Zagros Mountain in Iran here and Iraq, Toros Mountain here and the Dead Sea Fault system here. So this is the Arabian plate and I should emphasize here not only story of earthquake, but active volcanism. Many of you may not accept Walter Mooney here from USGS, who is working hard with the Saudis on active volcanoes here in the region. There are active volcanism in Arabia, historically. And the last big one here, 1256, was a major eruption. And there was another eruption in Yemen, 1937, many volcanic eruption, they have hazard, but I will not discuss. I want to especially discuss here the Dead Sea Fault System. It's really a mirror image of the San Andreas Fault System, as I will show. If you take, this is the Dead Sea Fault System here, and this one, San Andreas Fault, a mirror image. So the Salton Sea is here, this is the transverse ranges, go north. The offset, of course, bigger, 250 kilometer about, in, along San Andreas Fault, it's only about 100 kilometer in Dead Sea Fault. The movement here is little less than one centimeter per year. It's about three or more or less along the San Andreas Fault system. But they look very much similar. The restraining bend along the Dead Sea Fault, which is Lebanon, is similar really to transverse ranges here. So we go from the Gulf of Aqaba northward in the Dead Sea, the Sea of Galilee, Lebanon here, the bend, and all the way into, back to Syria and then to Turkey. By the way, the Gulf of Aqaba really the closest thing similar to the Gulf of California. Many feature characteristic Gulf of Aqaba is similar to Gulf of California. During the past 2,000 years, at, this is well documented. We know the historical earthquake in the Middle East better than any place on Earth, including China and Japan. During the 2,000 year, past 2,000 year, 14 earthquakes of magnitude 7 to 7.6 have occurred along the Dead Sea Fault system. And I disagree with my colleague at Stanford here, Professor Amos Noor, when he said the possibility of earthquake bigger than eight along this fault system, that's not true. At the maximum really possible quake size around seven and a half plus minus. But 14 of them happened. The last one being the Gulf of Aqaba happened in 1995. It only frightened few camels Really, there was not much of consequence. But it was like 7.2. If the same size earthquake happened 500 kilometers north, 
would have been a major catastrophe. Uh, the last one happened north, just west of Damascus, was in 1759. 1759, about 250 years ago. And made a lot of damage even 250 years ago. Damascus at that time was a relatively small city. The reason I'm, 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 I'm mentioning this because they come in cluster. Those large earthquakes come in cluster. For example, the largest we know quake happened was 1202, around seven and a half. We estimated the magnitude of that. It felt all the way from Italy to Iran. There was another earthquake, 1926, in Greek, but there was also a smaller one, the Palestine earthquake, 1927, 6.4. Now, the reason I'm saying these are major hazard potential because there are many mega cities, big cities. This is a map showing the Dead Sea, the northern section of the Dead Sea Fault system, like Jerusalem, Amman, Damascus, Beirut, Aleppo, and so on. These mega cities are within the very close nearby the fault system. And the repeat of any of those magnitude seven and above quakes will produce really major catastrophe in human and infrastructure. But I did mention also that there is also, I mentioned Alexandria. Why I mentioned Alexandria? Because many of those large great earthquake here that happened in the past, and they come in cluster, like the San Andreas Fault in a way. Every two or three hundred years, you get two or three or four of them. And they produce apparently major shaking, major shaking that produced tsunami in the Eastern Mediterranean. Israeli scientists, they map submarine, what they call disturbances. One of them called door disturbance. It's many tens of kilometer. And this disturbance, to understand it, you have to go back in time a little bit. About six million years ago, the whole Mediterranean kind of dried up. What's called the Messenian salinity crisis, where Gibraltar, because of plate movement, closed the whole Mediterranean start drying up, and as much as one kilometer of salt deposited, the Gibraltar opened again in, before the quaternary time, two million years ago or so, and more deposit, Pliocene and quaternary soft sediment deposit on top of the thick salt horizon. So when you, can, when you have a major shaking, you can have a slide here. This is a diagram showing the normal faulting of that disturbance and producing this normal faulting type. The slide produced major tsunami. And there is well-documented evidence. <clears throat> 10 large tsunami in the Eastern Mediterranean the past 2,000 years. Ten of them produced by earthquake along the Dead Sea Fault, inland. So the earthquake is on land, but the generated tsunami in eastern Mediterranean. This may result in major, major catastrophe for all the cities around eastern Mediterranean, but especially Alexandria I'm mentioning, because there are more than five million people living very close to the sea level, really, only a few meters higher than that. And there is historical evidence that Alexandria, and probably Alexandria Library, the old library, and so on, affected by great earthquake like this along the Dead Sea Fault system. There is a need for tsunami early warning system for the Eastern Mediterranean. And considerable efforts are needed really to better define the hazard and the preparedness and the hazard management. And obviously none of this is happening in that region. 
I'm going to stop talking about earthquakes because I'm going to go to the last part of the the presentation, which talking about science. This is sad, but I will. Uh, I have to go through it. Let me now discuss the third and last time, uh, the last topic, the current and the future of scientific research in the Arab region. Is there a hope? I will explain why my answer was no for the near future. The fundamental problem, in my opinion, is that first, human development in the Arab region is primarily based on individual initiative and not on organized and well-developed system of values and societal infrastructures. Second, and be careful, listen to this, what I'm going to say, because I'm going to repeat it. Second, the misuse and the misinterpretation of the two primary sources of Islam, the Quran and the Hadith, the Hadith being the prophetic tradition, the misuse and the misinterpretation have significantly contributed to minimize innovation on both individual and society level and all spheres of life, including science and especially women development. It is a cultural crisis that is in the making for hundreds of years. So this business of the Arab Spring is just a minor small manifestation of a much deeper crisis. The crisis is very deep, extremely serious, but is hardly noticed and rarely, rarely discussed. Let me shed some light on the decline of science in the Arab region. Let me start by stating major misconceptions. First, one of the misconceptions in the Arab region, science could be transferred without major planning and building a strong infrastructure for research and providing the required human development. Second, that basic science and research is dispensable for financial reasons. The Arab must understand that leapfrog, the development cycle does not work. You cannot buy or import science. How can I say that? There's at least more than 100,000 Saudi student studying in the United States alone. However, Saudi Arabia still have about more than 30% unemployment in the youth sector. So it's not working. Another example, there are three multi-billion dollar initiative, regional initiative in the Arab rich countries, the Gulf countries. They exemplify recent top-down approach in higher education and science that will also drain the poor Arab countries like Sudan or Morocco, or Syria, and so on. The first initiative, what they call the Qatar's Education City, Qatar Education City, started in 2001, involving at least six major research universities from the United States. The second one, Masdar Institute in Abu Dhabi, 2006, started involving MIT, big time. And third, the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia, north of Jeddah, in 2009 started. It's really an international university implemented by Aramco, the national oil company, and many other USA scholars and scientists. Though these I consider some of the candles of light, as I said, in a sea of darkness, their impact on human development in the Arab region is minimum and marginal, considering the magnitude of resources they have used. Let me provide you with some facts and information. 
As I said before, there's about 350 million people in the Arab region. They will, be, they will become 400 mil, million people in the Arab region in 2020. And best estimate, they will go to 600 million Arabs in 2050. This is the best estimate. Why? Because 60% now is under the age of 25 years old. 60% and more than 30% under the age of 15. And I should remind you, the best estimate is that 60, 65 million Arabs are still remain illiterate, and two thirds of them are women. Let me give you other information. Arab countries collectively spend, if you, all the Arab countries, they spend zero, 0.15% of their collective GDP, gross domestic product, GDP, only 0.15 on science, scientific research, and development, which add up to about $10 per person per year. Of course, the United States and Europe is spending about six to $700 per person per year. But the global average for spending on scientific research and development is 1.5%, 1 1.5% of GDP. That includes countries in Africa, in Asia, Bangladesh, etc. So the Arab spending is 10 times less. And the funny part and the sad part is that Saudi Arabia, the richest country obviously, only spent 0.05, 0.05% of their GDP on science and development, relative to their GDP, of course. Kuwait spent 0.09, and Qatar 0.33. These are the most recent estimate, 2010. In contrast, I should remind you that Israel spent about 4 0.4% of their GDP on science, one of the highest in the world. The United States, to give you reference, two, we spent 2.7%. It's interesting to note here, the new Muslim Brotherhood administration in Egypt, and the reason I mentioned that, because I should say that only seven Arab countries out of the 22 have a National Academy of Sciences, and most of them have no national science policy. But the new Muslim Brotherhood Administration Egypt declared an, is, an Islamist science policy, so-called. The first part of it, three goals. The first, support national defense security, okay. Second, ensuring equality, uh, uh, ensuring quality of life, okay. And the third one, proving the miraculous nature of the Islamic faith. I'm, 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 I'm at loss with that goal. Another, let me shift. The military expenditure of the Arab country, military expenditure, I should remind you, more than 70, 75% of all world arms, weapons, are sold by the United States, more than 75% sold by the United States. And the Arabs, the rich Arab country, are good customers. The, all the, the military expenditure, expenditure, the Saudi Arabia spent 10% of their GDP on military, Kuwait 7%, Oman 12%. In fact, the combined, if you take all everything Arab spend on health, all aspect of health and hospital. And remember, most Arab countries, they have a uh, government hospital system. And everything they spend on education, from kindergarten, all uh, elementary and university, and most university are government university. And everything they spend on, <coughs> on, on health and education, uh, 
and on science and research and development. If you combine all these three sectors together, the Arabs spend more money on military. Let me ch change again. All Arab countries produce, and in 2010, only 6,000 books on science and technology. Only the, some of it translated, not even authored. It's really low, extremely low. They are, the Arab, about 5% world population, and they produce only 1% of book. And most books are of religious nature. I will not discuss here, there's no time, lack of patents as a measure of development, and the brain drain. One half of all medical doctor produced in the Arab countries migrate to the West and North America, and about one quarter of all engineers. Most of the Arab universities, there's about 250 of them, private and public, in the whole Arab region, about 250, and all the research center, they, at, they are at best center for knowledge dissemination and lack of innovation widespread. If I want to give you an example, a very painful example, I'm approaching the end here, is that King Saud University and King Abdelaziz University in Saudi Arabia, they, they have, by appointing Western and USA well-known and accomplished scientists, well-known, some of them Nobel laureates, to make them adjunct professor at their universities, and they pay them somewhere between 50 to 100K per year for their use, uh, per scientist to gain visibility in research. When they publish their paper, they will put, you know, Harvard University, MIT, Columbia University, whatever it is, and King Saud University. That increases the citation index and put the university in better grace, supposedly. I don't blame only Saudi Arabia for doing this, and this supported by Ministry of Higher Education in Saudi Arabia, but also those scientists in the West and North America agreeing to go through this uh, Mickey Mouse deal. The major really problem deficit we have in the Arab region are freedom, women's right, and lack of knowledge and need to be addressed. I will, there's no time to go through them. Let me summarize by saying there's much needed Arab culture and scientific renaissance is needed. Requires a new, requires a new governing state system, new strategy, new policy, new education environment, and to promote freedom, creativity, innovation. And since this is not possible in the near future, hence my answer was no. Let me just say one last comment that many of you may know Dr. Ahmed Zuwail, the most prominent Arab American scientist at Caltech, Nobel laureate. And actually, he's a US science envoy by President Obama, wrote two papers last year in which he is blaming the whole problem in the Arab region on backward education system and that politics and religion must not interfere in education. This is correct, though I think that the problem is considerably more complicated and requires the restructuring of the Arab mind. Thank you. Thanks to Dr. Barazanji for his comments. Now it's time for um, the question and answer period, and we have quite a few, so we'll begin in just a second here. I'd like to remind the listening audience that this is a program of the Commonwealth Club of California, and you're listening to Oil Earthquakes and the Decline, Declining Science in Arabia with Dr. Mawaya Barazanji, Professor Emeritus at Cornell University. Um, You've got questions on all three aspects of your talk, so uh, 
uh, I think I'll select for starters at least one in each of those. And for the first question, you had uh, a number of people ask you for your assessment of this recent discovery of gas off the coast of Israel. Is it a significant thing? Will it help the region? Yes, there are great potential natural gas in the Eastern Mediterranean, especially offshore Egypt and Palestine and Israel, Gaza. And uh, there is every reason to be, to, from the early exploration and uh, that there will be a lot of production, natural gas in the Nile Delta also. Uh, you know, there is a problem, unfortunately, Israel not allowing the Palestinian Authority in Gaza, offshore Gaza, to access and contract for exploration which is sad. This is among many other things uh, Israel doing, really constraining uh, the, the freedom of Palestine in the region. But there are great potential of natural gas. Um, uh, the second set of questions have to do with the earthquake hazard there. <clears throat> and a number of questions uh, focused on the organization of regional groups of scientists throughout the Middle East. The question would be, are they working together to jointly assess earthquake hazards? Or is it mainly being done by a few isolated scientists, either in the Middle East or uh, perhaps uh, overseas, like here in the US? There are some attempts and uh, <coughs> sponsored by either UNESCO or other uh, 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 regional groups, and they have annual meeting in the region. Uh, but honestly, there is a big problem in coordination of scientific, even within any given country. I'm extremely familiar with countries like Morocco, Algeria, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Lebanon, Kuwait, Oman, uh, and I know what I'm talking about and there is complete lack of coordination inside any given country. That even in Saudi Arabia, to use examples, since one of my, our colleagues here from Saudi Arabia, is that what data they produce is difficult to use by other institutions, and uh, to share a lot of this information, not easy. There is, uh, the administrator usually have problem in understanding of the scientific reason and rationale for many of these projects. So there is a major problem in communication within any given country, and there is lack, really, of coordination on, uh, aside from conferences. And uh, scientists like to talk, but uh, there is really no major uh, grassroots uh, effort. Um, good. And then uh, with regard to your last point, uh, the role of science and technology in the Middle East, there were a number of questions that, that focused around the issue of um, the leadership in the region. And in particular, one of the questions was, do Islamic leaders see science as a threat? Is that what's holding back the development in science there? Well, that would be the wrong leader. I mean, no Muslim would think science is bad. Uh, Islam is not the problem. I, I strongly emphasize that. Islam is not the problem. It's the Muslims are the problem. How they interpreted their sources over the years. And uh, hence, uh, any Muslim scholar, real scholar, they will strongly encourage scientific activity and endeavor, really in all sphere of science. But I'm surprised, the reason I mentioned about the Muslim Brotherhood uh, declare goals and agenda for them to put such an item on their agenda. Uh, Quran is not a scientific book. It's a, a book for guidance. Uh, uh, for humanity and the Muslims. Uh, and hence, to twist that uh, uh, goal, uh, uh, that activity is not really appreciated. I'll be glad to answer more questions, depends on the time. And I'll stay behind for more questions if anybody wants to discuss. 
Very good. Uh, unfortunately, we're coming to the end of our program here. We have time for perhaps one last question, and I'd like to follow up on the last one that you answered. A and just uh, several people asked, what would it take for an Ar Arab Bill Gates to emerge? Is there something the societies there could be doing differently? We used to have in the Muslim world the, the concept of waqf endowment. It's really started in the Muslim world uh, for hundreds of years. Unfortunately, with the advent of uh, the colonization and subsequently the, the dictatorship type governmental system, whether from the right or the left, they killed that institution of waqf, the endowment. And, uh, and hence, now, majority of those contribute, they contribute to build mosque. We have enough mosque in the Arab Muslim world. <laughs> we need other type of institution. There are, as I said, many billionaires in the Arab region. We need them to take initiative, a wise initiative, and make sure they institute to build infrastructure and go back to the education system and the concept and to re-educate the elementary kids uh, starting about the real Islam and Muslim ideas. That's why I predict the failure in Afghanistan because the United States and Afghanistan trying to impose development without real development of the brain and to understand why you can be, you know, why you should treat women differently and their Islamic uh, religion. Very good. Um, maybe this will be the last question. We'll cycle around to oil again, and perhaps a question that's of more interest to the folks here in the United States, and that is, the growth of this natural gas production in the U.S. over the last few years, how is that going to affect the need for the U.S. to import oil, let's say, over the next 10 or 20 years? Well, I just heard a presentation yesterday from the director of science of the Department of Energy. So he's supposed to be informed. I assume he's informed. And he showed us a graph that shows that the need of U.S. oil until 2035, 2035, will be about the same level we are using here. And I asked him the question, where that oil coming from? Of course, some of it will come from the shale oil, will increase production, but it will not be enough. I think the United States will continue to import oil they may import more from Canada, from the oil sand, and from other sources, but you have to pay a price for the environmental issues. So there's always balance between national security and environmental concern. And unfortunately, usually the environmental concern lose because of national interest. And uh, oil will continue to be a main source for transportation for at least the next 50 years. Unless we could be wrong and uh, some revolution in technology can make it possible for use natural gas for transportation on a big time. Great. Thank you. Our thanks to Dr. Mauri Berezanji, Professor Emeritus at Cornell University, for his comments here today. We also thank our audience here, as well as those listening to the recording. And now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, celebrating over 109 years of enlightened discussion, is adjourned. Good job.